Hello everyone. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday, January 12th, the, there was this big storm and we had to cancel church. However, I still have a sermon, so I thought that I would record it and share it with you so you could uh, decide if you want to watch it. And uh, so here it is. <sighs> Time goes quickly, and I'm not just saying this because I will turn 50 very soon. No, since the beginning of the year, uh, there, there are plenty of articles in the newspaper, for example, about the change that happened in the last 10 years. If today, for example, if today we cannot go in a museum or uh, visit a public attraction without bumping people taking a selfie, well, this word, this very word, selfie, uh, made its way in our dictionaries only six years ago. In the older days, when you met a celebrity, you would find a piece of paper and a pen, so a war pen and we would ask uh, an autograph in order to show it to your friends next time you will see them. For example, my wife's father was a border services officer and one day he found a way to obtain the autograph of Walt Disney, which we still own today. Well, these days, if you meet someone remotely famous well, you just pull your cell phone, take a selfie, post it immediately on, on social media so everyone can see it right now. We live in a different world. And yet, the technology and the practice might have changed significantly in the last few years, yes. But I suspect that the goals of the people have remained the same. Because you see, both an autograph and a selfie are a snapshot of a special moment in our lives that might not happen again. Our aim is to capture something important or unique. It, it's strange because a simple piece of paper or with a few scribble on it or a a digital photo does not tell the full story, the context, the, the emotion we felt that day. They are just inanimate objects. Still, when we look at them, they have the power to trigger our memories, to bring, back, bring us back into a very specific moment, to remind her being a reminder of a special event in our lives. On what was the scripture reading for this morning? Well, it was all about Jesus' baptism. And this event must have felt very significant for the first Christian. Sorry, because it is one of the few that we found in all of the four Gospels in our New Testament. Just between you and me, sometimes I wonder if Instagram existed back then, if Jesus would have posted a selfie of himself being baptized with the hashtag baptism, hashtag bless, but that's something else. Oh. If last week we were celebrating the visit of the wise men, who paid a visit to the infant Christ, well, this week we leap forward 30 years later. At this time, John the Baptist uh, is attracting large crowds in the wilderness. At the edge of the River Jordan, he is calling to repentance his people to turn back to God's way to reject corrupt leadership. John is at the top of his game. He is the man. And one day, his distant cousin shows up and seeks to be baptized like everybody else. And John tried to dissuade him. I cannot do this. Yes, you can. You first. No, you first. After you. No, after you. Eventually, 
they stop this back and forth and Jesus is baptized in front of everyone. And what happened next is very interesting. Each gospel has a slightly different version of this event. In Matthew, the, the text that interests us this week, well, when Jesus comes up from the water, the heavens are open to him and he sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And notice here, the text does not say that everyone present that day sees the heavens opening and the dove descending on him. No, only Jesus is the witness of all of this. And then God, or to be more precise, a voice from heavens, says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This succession of multi-century events raise many questions for believers from the beginning of Christianity. If he is the Son of God, why would Jesus need to be baptized? Was it a Christian baptism? Assuming that most of us never experienced something remotely close to all of this, is it possible that the, the dove was just a dove and the voice from heavens nothing more than a nicely timed windstorm? Why this divine revelation was limited only to Jesus? And most importantly for some, why does God choose this specific moment to appear and to declare that Jesus is God, beloved Son, with whom God is pleased? Because how God, uh, sorry, how God can be pleased with Jesus since he has not begun his public ministry yet. It's only chapter 3 in, in Matthew. He has not performed any miracle nor said words worthy of praising. To be honest, up to this point, Jesus is Mr. Nobody. His greatest accomplishment up to this point was to show up at the day of his own baptism. It feel a bit I don't know. It, it's like when Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize less a year after being elected. Hashtag awkward. So what's the point here? Well, Celtic, Celtic Christianity developed this concept called the thin place. T-H-I-N, like narrow, not T-I-N, the metal. Thin place. And those thin plays show up where the boundaries between the mundane and the holy becomes permeable. When God and humanity can touch each other. For example, ju just to illustrate this, just imagine being in a room in total darkness. Then a door slightly open and through the crack a beam of light make his way into the room. At this moment, both darkness and light coexist and touch each other. Well, in those thin places, we can really experience the presence of God in a similar way. Sometimes it feels grandiose and spectacular, but most often thin places manifest themselves in their ordinary life. During a walk in the field, uh, a few second, a few seconds of silence in our chaotic and busy day, or laughter shared with our loved ones, they may last only a few seconds, but their aftermath if, heck, can stay with us for the rest of our life. Jesus' baptism is one of those thin places during which the barrier is open and God that we all long for is revealed. On this special day, 
the events and her world intersect. It, like the star of Bethlehem, this event makes a statement about the breaking through which is to come. It is an epiphany. Epiphany, a, a word that comes from the Greek that means appearing, revealing. And approximately 2,000 years later, we still perform baptism in our church as a way to remember this special event. Despite different tradition and theology across Christianity, it has become one of the most important and significant sacrament of our faith. And still, it's important, but the meaning of baptism still eludes many of us today. You would be surprised by the question and the comments a minister receive about this. Uh, would uh, baptize, baptizing my child in ants is sacredness, guarantee her life ever, happy ever, or provide them a VIP pass for heaven? Uh, no. <laughs> nope. So what's the point, Reverend? What is the big deal about baptism? Why should we wake up early on Sunday morning, dress up, come to your church, stand at the front before everyone, answer two or three strange questions, have our child receive a few drops of water on the forehead, if it does not guarantee any direct benefit? I know that Jesus has done it, but Jesus also wrecked havoc in the temple and we have not turned it into a sacrament. Might have been nice, but you know, if you want more opinion, Reverend, maybe you should skip this whole baptism business and replacing it with selling membership cards. It would be more efficient and lucrative. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. But maybe that's not what baptism is all about. It is more than an ancient ritual, and it's not promising a status or a reward, nor a privilege we or our parent should earn through piety and regular church attendance. The truth is that baptist, sorry, baptism has almost nothing to do with us. It's all about God. As it's said beautifully in Song of Faith, the latest statement of faith of the United Church of Canada, before conscious thought or action of our part, we are surrounding by God's redeeming love. Before we even aware of it, we are God beloved. And the good news is that we don't have to accomplish anything to earn it. God's love is a free gift granted to all. And God wants to distribute this blessing to us. And God swears to remain with us forever, regardless if we choose to respond to this offer. Baptism does not make us beloved. It simply highlights a reality, a fact. It acknowledges that the place that we have in God's heart, and maybe this is why we feel it's such a special and unique moment in our lives. There's nothing like looking at pictures of baptism, even if it's not our own child. Of course, they don't tell the whole story of Uncle Bob who arrived late or a cousin Aaron who forgot to bring the family Bible. There are just snapshots, selfies, helping us to go beyond the ordinary surfaces of our life and helping us to discover those thin place where God is revealed. They help us to remember our steadfast love, the steadfast love of God for us and the promise of God enduring presence at our side until our last breath. And for this, we can say, thanks be to God and amen.